Nick Cooney, he's a quite prominent American uh, animal welfare advocate. Um, he's the founder and director of the organization The Humane Lib. Um, this organization has been top rated by the animal charity evaluator Effective Animal Activism. So they seem to be doing uh, really effective work. Nick is also an author. He has uh, written a book titled Change of Heart. And in that book, he has compiled um, crucial findings from psychology, so from the science of persuasion, essentially, and has tried to apply them to uh, the work of animal advocacy and to the question of how we can uh, make this work uh, more effective. And I guess that will be tonight's topic. Um, very much looking forward to your talk. Thanks again for being with us. Okay. Thank and you. Even nonprofits are starting to get 
to using research and testing to figure out how they can be more successful at the work they are trying to accomplish. For example, one of the most pressing human health issues today in the world is the spread of malaria. There's around, I believe, about 5 million people that still die of malaria each year. So one of the things that anti-malaria organizations do to stop the spread of malaria, which often comes from being pricked by a mosquito, is they distribute bed nettings like these, that you can sleep inside, and so while you're sleeping, you keep mosquitoes away, and you keep malaria away. But one question these nonprofits had is this. Some of them were just giving the nets away for free, so everyone had it. Others felt, you know what, if we make people pay just a really small amount, like one euro or half a euro, it's something that pretty much everyone can afford, and because they've invested something of themselves in it, they're going to be more likely to actually use these nets night after night. But the problem was, no one knew which approach was more effective. No one knew which approach would save more lives. So, so researchers, researchers came in and they worked with some of these nonprofits, and they just decided, you know what, let's test it out. They, in one area, did one approach, in a similar area, did another approach, and they found out that, lo and behold, giving the nets away for free was the best way to reduce the spread of malaria. So simple, a simple research project, a simple test, was able to help all of these anti-malaria organizations now save more lives, do more good, for the same amount of time and money and energy. Now, as you know, uh, we're not here today really to talk about advancing human health and uh, human welfare exactly, more about talking, talking about the plight of animals. Right? Can we use the same research and testing that politicians and businesses and other nonprofits are using to be more effective in advocating for a better world for animals? You know, if we think about the cruelties done to animals, and if we think about any of the work that any of our organizations or any of us as individuals are doing to try to help the plight of animals, pretty much everything we are working on comes down to one simple thing. And that is changing human behavior. So whether that's getting members of the public to go vegetarian or go vegan, whether it is getting politicians to vote in support of animal friendly laws, whether it's getting the heads of companies to change their policies in a direction that helps animals. Every one of these things hinges on changing human beliefs and, most importantly, changing human behavior. Now, there's some things that we as animal advocates and our movement tell ourselves, some things that sound good, that feel good, but that aren't necessarily true. For example, we sometimes tell ourselves that our movement will succeed because we are on the side of compassion. In the U.S., there's an often quoted uh, phrase from Martin Luther King, which he said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but ultimately it bends towards justice. A very comforting notion. Maybe we tell ourselves that we'll succeed if we just really, really, really care about animals. Or we'll succeed if we work very hard. Now, obviously, every one of these things should make us hopefully will make us more likely to succeed. But if we look back through history, and if we look around the world today, we see that these things may be helpful, but they definitely do not guarantee success. There are far too many causes today in history where those who are on the side of justice and compassion failed, where those who worked hard, those who cared a lot, failed. So what is it going to take for us as animal advocates to succeed at the work we're doing as much as possible. Well, I think that we'll succeed at changing beliefs and behaviors and consequently helping animals if we take the time to learn what really actually motivates people to change those beliefs and to change those behaviors. And so psychology research is really or can really be a roadmap to changing human behavior and changing society. And just as I or any of us hope to get into a car and drive to a new town without first getting the directions of how to get from point A to point B, it would be a bit presumptuous of us to think, to assume, that we know how to get members of the public or politicians or business leaders to go from behavior A to behavior B, or belief A to belief B, without us first learning the technical directions on how to get them there. So I think that we as a movement and, and any of us working on any social justice issue really, but to speak specifically to, let's say, advoc vegan advocacy. A lot of the examples I'm going to give today come from the field of vegetarian and vegan advocacy, but they're certainly applicable to any work for animals. 
So we as, as animal activists, we have, I think, two choices. One is, like the alchemists, we can assume, just as the alchemists assume they could turn lead into gold without any testing and research showing that to be the case. We can assume that we know how to turn omnivores into vegetarians without doing any testing to show that what we're doing is actually the best way to do it. Or, like the chemists, we can insert the scientific method into the good work we are already doing to become even more effective for animals. Now, one of the reasons this is so important is because our assumptions about what motivates people to change their attitudes and to change their behaviors are so often incorrect. I'm going to cite a number of studies tonight. Uh, some are specific to the field of animal protection and vegan eating. Uh, many are not, but the research is certainly very useful for us. So here's one example. There was uh, some environmental researchers who wanted to see how they could get homeowners to reduce the amount of energy they were using in their homes. So what they did is they created four different booklets, each of which uh, spoke about one reason to conserve. So one booklet spoke about the environmental reasons to conserve. The second booklet spoke about the financial uh, savings of conserving. The third spoke about the benefits to the community. And the fourth said that many people were already conserving. So researchers went around the homes in one particular neighborhood, and they left just one of these brochures at each home. They then worked with the local utility company to monitor the actual energy usage of these homes over the next three months. And of these four leaflets, which one would you guess was most effective at getting people to change their behavior in a way that benefited the environment. Who would say the first one, well, the environmental message? The second one, financial message. All right. Who would say the third one, benefits the community? And fourth one, other people are doing it. All right, so we got a kind of split house here, and it turned out that of all of these brochures, only one actually got people to reduce their home energy usage. And it was, in fact, the fourth one. Now, the one that simply said other people were doing this was the only one of these brochures that succeeded at the goal. Now, if I was running an environmental organization here uh, in Switzerland, and I wanted people to reduce their home energy usage, chances are I would use an environmental message because I'm an environmental campaign. Or maybe I would appeal to other people's financial self-interest. The point is that our assumptions about what will motivate, motivate behavior change and also attitude change are often which is why, when it comes to animal advocacy, it's so important that we base our decisions not on philosophy and guesses and assumptions, but we base our concrete advocacy decisions simply on what works, what succeeds at changing attitudes and behaviors and saving the lives and sparing the suffering of animals. Now, uh, thankfully for us as animal advocates, there are literally thousands and thousands of peer-reviewed academic studies that show what works and what doesn't. And if you were to go to the university library here, I'm sure you could find these thousands and thousands of studies. And perhaps to some of you, uh, the idea of reading thousands of studies sounds like a good time. But I imagine to most of us, it's kind of a frightening proposition. <laughs> so no need to worry when you spend the next three months in the library. Uh, I tried to go through as many of these boring studies as possible and compile the results, uh, the results that were useful to us as advocates into this book, uh, Change of Heart, what psychology can teach us about spreading social change, which looks at the research on, again, what works, and what does it for changing beliefs and behavior. I also have a new book that just came out called Veganomics, which looks at all the research specific to vegans and vegetarians and people eating less meat. And so what I'm going to do with the rest of my time today is I'm going to share what I think are some of the most important points from this research most important in that they are useful to us. They can make us become more effective animal advocates. All right, so first we're going to talk about persuading others. And I'm going to share some tools that the research suggests we can use to be more effective in our work. And the first one is stories versus statistics. So let's say we're talking with a friend, a family member, another student here about factory farming and vegetarian eating. You know, what approach is going to be more effective? Is it better to tell a story about an individual animal? Is it better to show how big the problem is, the millions of animals itself? Or is it better to do both? Well, um, some researchers wanted to put this question to the test. And now, they were not animal advocates, so they looked at another very serious issue, the issue of starvation in Africa. And they created three fundraising letters. 
The first one spoke about the, how big the problem was. So it spoke about the tens of millions of people facing starvation, the millions of people displaced by war and famine. The second letter had none of that. It just had the story of one young girl and what life was like for her as a child facing starvation. And the third letter had both. It had the statistics, but it also had the story of this young girl. So the letters were sent out, the donations came back in, and at the end of the day, again, what would you guess? Which letter would you guess got the most donations, went the furthest to fight starvation and save human lives? Who would say the first one with the statistics? Second one with the story. Third one with the story and the statistics. All right. So it turned out that of these three letters, one did about twice as good as either of the other two. And it was, in fact, the second one. The letter that only had the story of the young girl. The letter with both the story and the stats did only slightly better than the stats of the letter. Now, if we human beings who are in general calculating and logical people who base our actions and our ethics and our kindness and compassion on logic, hearing that millions of people are starving should probably make us donate more than hearing that one person is starving. But you know, we humans are certainly not uh, logical, rational creatures. And what this study shows is, again, our assumptions are not always correct. And in this instance, it shows that stories are incredibly powerful. There's other studies that have also shown, for whatever reason, when most people think analytically in terms of, in terms of numbers, they become less compassionate, less willing to change the behavior, less willing to engage in some sort of compassionate behavior. One other example of the power of stories. There was a university professor in the US who had his class design and give talks about a subject of each of their choosing. After all the talks were given that day, he polled the students to see what they remembered from one another's talks. And what he found is that of the facts, the statistics presented that day, only 5% were remembered by other students. But of the stories presented that day, a full 60% were remembered by other students. So not only are stories inherently more emotionally powerful and more persuasive, they're also sticky. They stick in our mind, we remember them, they influence our attitudes and behaviors. So, what does this mean for us as animal advocates? Well, what it means is that, you know, because we know how, we know the extent of how many animals are suffering and how bad it is, we're often tempted to try to convey that when we're talking with friends, family, and the public. But what these studies suggest is that we'll be more effective if we focus on an individual animal, individual animals, and tell the story of what life is like for him or her on a day-to-day -day basis on the factory farm. All right, moving on, the best request. So if I was uh, speaking to just kind of a general class here at the university tomorrow, let's say in an English class or a creative writing class, and I was able to talk about anything, and I was able to encourage them to make some change in their life that I would think would be the right thing to do. There's a whole range of requests that we make. And you know, all of us in our own lives, we tend to want as much as we can get. Right? We want the most pleasure, the most success, and we want the world to change as much as possible in a way that benefits animals. So if I was going in and talking to this English class here at the university <coughs> tomorrow, what would be the best thing I should encourage them to do? In an ideal world, you know, or not even an ideal world, what I would really like every student there to do, but what I think would be the ethical thing to do, and the thing that would really help animals would, of course they should all be here. Of course, they should all become full-time animal rights activists. They should not drive. They should not have children. You know, and on and on and on, right? But if I stood up there and I said all these things that I really wanted from them, chances are they would think I'm crazy and they would not do anything at all. So that's one approach, making really big requests, saying exactly what we want. Another option is a small request, something that's much easier for people to agree to, or maybe something in the middle. Which one of those requests, large, small, middle, would you think to be most effective at creating behavior change? Uh, some researchers looked at this, and I will show you the results in a second, but who would say the encouraging a small behavior change creates the most behavior change in total? Who would say medium? Who would say large? All right, so you've been pretty right so far on this one. The majority of you are wrong. Of course, everything's relative, but it was kind of in that middle range. It was that middle range of requests that accomplished the most behavior change. And specifically, 
what the researchers have found in the studies that have been done is that the ideal message is encouraging people to make a change that is significant, but that people could probably picture themselves doing. If they can't picture themselves doing it, it's probably too large a request, few people will change, few behavior change will be accomplished. On the other hand, if it's very easy, sure, a lot of people may do it, but because it's only a small change, when you add all that change together, it's not accomplishing a whole lot. Now, what, is this, uh, what does this mean for us as advocates of, of the behavior? Well, here we kind of get into the, range, the, the realm of assumptions and guesses, but my assumption, based on this research, and looking at surveys in terms of public attitudes about vegetarianism and veganism, is this. Polls in both the US and Europe find that the large majority of the public thinks that vegan eating, vegan eating is overly restrictive and is unhealthy. Sizable portions of the public also think that vegetarian is too restrictive, or unhealthy, so on and so forth. On the other hand, probably the vast majority of the public seems to think that cutting back on meat consumption is generally a good thing and something that they could do. Now, this is starting to change, especially on university campuses where a growing number of students are at least vegetarian. In the US, we're up to 12% in latest studies. I don't know exactly what it is in Switzerland, but in Germany, it's up to 12%. Austria, a recent poll found 17%. So those percentages are growing. So my takeaway for the research is this. The message that will create the most behavior change, I'm guessing, is a request in the range of cutting back on meat consumption to going vegetarian. That seems to be the range of requests that people are more likely to be able to picture themselves doing, and therefore more likely to change. Now, one other thing that we should keep in mind when we consider what requests we're making of the public when it comes to diet change is this. Not all animals suffer to the same extent for the average eater. Now, this study, or this, this data is from the US, so it's not going to be exactly the same here in Switzerland, but the general ratio is the same. So what I did is I took the number of animals, the average meat eater eats each year, which in the US is 12. I took the number of animals and I multiplied the animals by how long they live. So the average American eats 28 chickens and the average chicken lives 40 days. You know, you do the math and you're getting close to 800, 900 days of suffering caused by the average meat eater. So if you add all this up and then you display it like we're doing here, what we can see is that when it comes to farmed animals, and these are all farmed animals, the fish does not include wild fish. The vast majority of suffering that the average meat eater causes are caused to farm raised fish and chickens. Either chickens raised for the meat or chickens raised for their eggs. So, if we're talking to a friend, a family member, a member of the public, and they're not willing to go vegan, not willing to go vegetarian, but they might be willing to do something, I think that probably the best request we could make of them, the first step we should encourage them to take, which is cutting out cutting back on farmers fish and chicken and maybe eggs as much as possible. Not only is that an easier change to make because you're only taking out one, maybe two animal products, but just by removing those things, they can spare 50 to 95% of the suffering that they're causing with their diet. And we see the chicken. All right, moving on. Foot in the door. So probably many of you can guess what foot in the door, the psychological phenomenon is all about. But I'm going to give you a study that's going to make perfectly clear what it's all about. So, some researchers in California wanted to figure out how they could get homeowners to put up these yard signs in the front yard that said drive safe to protect the children in the neighborhood. So they went around to homes in one neighborhood and knocked on doors and said, hi, we're promoting safe driving. We were hoping you would put this yard sign out in your front yard. And because the signs were not that attractive, only about 20% agreed to and did put the yard signs out in the front yard. Researchers then went to other homes in the same neighborhood, but this time they left the yard signs at home, and they brought with them these little 5 centimeter by 5 centimeter window stickers. They also said, if I say, Dr. Dora said, hey, we're promoting safe driving, but we wondered if you would put these stickers up in your window. And because it was such an easy thing to do, virtually everyone agreed to and did put up these window stickers. Three weeks later, researchers went back to the same homes that had gotten the window stickers. And this time they brought with them the ugly yard signs. Now Pandora said, hey, it's me again. Thank you so much for putting up that window sticker a couple weeks ago. And now we wondered if you would put this sign out in your front yard as well. And this time, not 20%, but about 70% agreed to and did put out the ugly yard signs. 
<laughs> so even though the goal of the researchers was to get these signs in people's front yards, they were much more effective at doing so by first making a similar, smaller request that most people would likely to say yes to, waiting for a little time to pass, and then going back and making their second, real, larger request. There are literally over a thousand studies documenting the power of the, this foot-in-the-door approach. Just to give you two other very brief examples, a study found that people asked to sign a petition to support the building of a recreation center for the physically handicapped. The next week, donated twice as much money as people never even asked to sign the petition. Similarly, people asked to wear a pin from, uh, for the Canadian Cancer Society. The next week, again, donated about twice as much money to that organization as people who had never even asked to wear the pin in the first place. Why, why can foot in the door be so powerful? Well, researchers think that it works because it shapes our sense of self-identity. So once I put on that pin, you know, even if you know, I don't really care about cancer, I just haven't thought about it that much, but sure, like, I'll, I'll wear your little pin. Once I sign that petition, once I put up that window sticker, I start to think of myself, at least subconsciously, as I guess I'm the sort of person who cares about cancer, otherwise why would I be wearing this pin? <laughs> and so when someone comes along and asks us to do more help by cancer, we again, on that subconscious level, think, yeah, that's, that's something that, that I'm interested in, that's important to me, here's a donation, here's volunteer time, whatever it is. So what does this mean for us as animal advocates? Well, there are some animal advocates who have the concern, the very understandable concern, and the belief that we should always and only promote vegan eating, because that is, of course, what we would like everyone in society to do. And the concern is that if we encourage people to do anything less, such as go vegetarian or reduce the meat consumption, that yes, people may make those changes, but they'll become complacent, they'll stop there, and they won't go on to ultimately adopt the diet that we would like them to adopt, the diet that is most compassionate for animals. It's an understandable concern. Thankfully, if we look to put it into the research, we see that it's not a concern that we need to have. People who make a small change become more likely to make a similar, larger change down the line. If, and this is an important if, if they're encouraged to do so. Whether that's through reading a newspaper article, being contacted by somebody else, so on and so forth. So, what this means is that we are free as animal advocates to target our message to our audience. We can encourage the behavior change that is going to create the most behavior change. Even if it's not promoting veganism, we can use the message that will do the most good, and it will do the most good not only in the short term, but also in the long term as well. So ironically, it seems that the best way to create the most vegans is not to promote vegan eating, and it's not to the general public. It's probably to promote something small. All right, moving on, let's talk about social norms. You know, we all like to think of ourselves as these bold, independent creatures who have the beliefs we have and live the lives we live because we've thought about it, we've decided, this is who I am, this is what I believe, this is how I'm going to live my life. But the reality is that most of us are just like everyone else, either other people in general or at least other people in our social and peer group. We are very influenced by what other people are doing. We saw that earlier in the study about reducing global energy usage. And there are countless other studies showing the same thing, showing that messages that are so-called social norms messages which basically say lots of people are doing this thing, are very effective at getting people, getting more people to do that thing. So let me give you just one other example of this from the research. There was a uh, hotel chain that wanted their guests to start reusing bath towels each night. Now, their main reason was financial. If people used or wanted a new towel every night, that meant more laundry to do, more water, more electricity, more staff. So by getting people to reuse their towels, it would save the hotel chain money. But of course, it would also be good for the environment because, again, less water being used, less electricity, and so forth. So what they did is they put little signs up in each hotel room that basically said, in order to help us protect the environment, we encourage you to please reuse your bath towels. And you know, the science works. Uh, some people started reusing their bath towels. But some researchers who happened to be staying in the hotel and saw these signs thought, no, we could probably do a better job. So they worked with the hotel chain. And what they did is they took out all those signs that had the environmental message. And they put in new signs that just had one single sentence. Most guests in this hotel reused their bath towels. Said nothing about the environment. And switching from the environmental to the social norms message, as you could have guessed, increased power use by about 20%. And in fact, 
when the, 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 uh, the cards were made even more specific. So they said that most guests in room 309, or whatever room it was, you use the towels, you know, towel use increased even further. So uh, that's just one other example. There's many other studies documenting this. So what is the takeaway of this for us as animal advocates, as advocates of vegan eating? Well, of course, we want to talk about the cruelties done to farm animals. Of course, we want to talk about the health benefits of moving towards being vegan. But the more we also throw in these social norms messages, the more effective we'll be at getting other people to change their diet in a compassionate way. So we can talk about politicians or athletes or celebrities who have gone vegetarian or vegan. We can point to the growing availability of vegan food in restaurants and grocery stores. We can point out the growing number of people in general or students in specific of your student athletes who are going vegetarian or vegan. And the more we do any of these things, the more we show and portray that vegan eating or vegetarian eating is this huge growing trend, it's so, it's so popular, so many people are doing it, the more likely it will be to get other people to join in and make the same changes themselves. Now, one, uh, one other consequence of social norms and the fact that we're influenced by others is this. The research shows that we are much more likely to be influenced by people who are similar to us. So studies have found that if, if, if I am similar to my audience in terms of things like age, or gender, or political beliefs, or social beliefs, or whether or not I smoke, religious beliefs, even my body language and the way I speak, if I am the more similar I am to my audience in any one of these areas, the more likely I'll be to persuade them to change their beliefs and change their behavior. So what does this mean for us as an alive Well, it means that if you want to be as effective as possible, persuading people to change and sparing lives or saving, uh, sparing the suffering of animals, then we need to tailor ourselves and our message to our audience. So, if we were doing a vegan advocacy at a punk concert, we probably would want to look one way. And if we were doing it at a conference of conservative politicians, we probably would want to dress and speak in a different way if we want to be as effective as possible. One other thing this means is that, again, if we want to be as effective as possible for animals, we should probably leave other issues that we care about, whether political issues, social issues, religious or anti-religious issues, off the table when we're doing animal advocacy. Unless we know, unless we're positive that the other person agrees with us. Because let's say, for example, I'm doing vegan outreach or leafleting here at the university, and a student comes up to talk to me, and you know, we're having a conversation, and they're kind of interested in learning more, and uh, you know, I start mentioning about how I hate conservative politicians or something like that. And there they happen to be conservative themselves. It's so easy for them to think, subconsciously or consciously, oh, well, you know, he's a stupid liberal, liberals are wrong about everything, so of course they're wrong about this whole eating thing. So, if we, again, if we want to be as effective as possible, when we're doing animal advocacy, we need to leave these other issues off the table. One other aspect of targeting our audience is this. There are different groups in society who are more likely, much more likely, to go vegetarian, to go vegan. And what this means is that if we target our efforts towards those groups, we can be significantly more effective. So what groups are most likely to be interested in going and to actually go vegetarian or vegan? Well, there are two. First, as probably you all could have guessed, women. In every country that's ever been surveyed, the number of vegetarian and vegan women outnumbers the number of vegetarian and vegan men by at least a 2 to 1 ratio, often a 3 to 1 ratio, if you look at them as a whole. Also, young people. Also, not a big surprise, people between the ages of 15 and 30 are much more likely to go vegetarian or go vegan than any other age group. So what this means is that by focusing our vegan advocacy on these groups, young people, women, young women, best of all, we can, <laughs> we can create two to three times more vegetarians, more vegans, probably more human users as well, than by focusing our advocacy efforts on the public as a whole. All right. Moving on, uh, last, last tool of persuasion I want to talk about here tonight, and that is showing them how. Because we know, I know we don't have those here in Switzerland anymore, thankfully, um, in the US we still do have these battery cages for egg laying hens. Because we know how badly farm animals suffer, we always want to tell people the many reasons why, 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 why they should move towards being vegan. So certainly all the whys about why it's bad for animals, and also why it's good for the environment, why it's good for our health, why it's good for social justice, and on and on and on. 
We spend, we spend so much time focusing on the whys, but not nearly enough time focusing on the how to actually make these diet and lifestyle changes. And I think part of the reason for that is because when we've been doing something for a long time, it seems to be, it's, you know, we start to think it's a real easy thing to do. And we forget about the fact that people who have never done it before, to them, it may seem like an impossible task. Right? <laughs> so while of course we need to make people want to go vegan, move in that direction, we also need to make them feel they know how to make the switch. And there was a really interesting uh, meta-analysis that looked at over 200 behavior change studies. Uh, this analysis came out about two or three years ago. And what it found is that, not surprisingly, attitude mattered. So, uh, I'm sorry, they were trying to figure out what, uh, what was the best predictor whether or not people will change their behavior. And so not surprisingly, they found that attitude mattered. People who wanted to make a change and thought it was a good change to make were more likely to make that change. Not surprising. What was a bit surprising is that that was not the biggest predictor of whether or not people actually changed their behavior. The biggest predictor was whether or not people felt they had the ability to make those changes. So again, it's not, it's not enough for us to make people want to go vegetarian or vegan or think that that's the right thing to do. Just as important, perhaps even slightly more importantly, we need to leave them feeling like they know how to make these changes. Now, if you look to the studies that have been done on the main barriers that non-vegetarians see between them and a vegetarian or vegan diet, or the main barriers that have driven current vegetarians and current vegans to go back to eating meat, there are four main barriers, four main how questions that people perceive or have a problem with. The first of these is taste. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know how anyone can look at a block of cold, gelatinous tofu and not think that that is the most delicious thing. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently some people disagree. So people worry about giving up the foods and flavors they know and love. They will think that vegan food doesn't taste good and so on and so forth. The second very big barrier is health. A lot of people think vegetarian and vegan eating is healthy, but a lot of people still think that it is unhealthy or can be unhealthy. And the biggest health concern of all, especially among young people, is protein, getting that protein. <laughs> Third, a little further down the list, convenience. People feel they don't know where to buy vegan food, how to prepare it, so on and so forth. And lastly, social issues. People worry that if they're vegetarian, if they're vegan, and they're out with their vegan friends, and they want to go out to a restaurant, or a bar, or whatever, um, it's just going to be awkward because they're the only vegan, the only vegetarian, there won't be anything for them to eat, so on and so forth. It just won't really work socially. These are the four main barriers that people perceive. So we, if we want to be effective at getting people to go vegetarian and go vegan, we need to address these barriers. We need to show people how to find really delicious vegan food, perhaps how to prepare it. We need to give them a couple of simple health tips on how to be healthy as a vegetarian or vegan. We need to show, help them learn how to navigate those social situations. This is important, again, not just for inspiring more people to go vegetarian or vegan, but also for getting those who have already gone vegetarian or vegan to stay in that diet. Because the unfortunate reality is that for every four people who say they are vegetarian today, three of them, at least three of them, will eventually go back to eating meat. So the more, and, and the major reasons for going back to eating meat were the same four barriers we just talked about. Health was actually slightly above taste, Health and taste with the two days. So the more we address these barriers, we'll inspire more people to change and keep more people eating a compassionate diet. Now I'm um, getting towards being done, but before I finish, you know, I've been talking for the last 25 minutes about tools we can use to get other people to change their beliefs and their behaviors. But before I finish, I want to kind of turn the mirror on ourselves and look at our own psychology and how our own psychology can either help or hurt our desire to create a better world for animals. The problem is that it's sometimes difficult to face ourselves <laughs> and to face our true motivations for doing the animal advocacy work that we do. For example, I'm sure everyone in here who considers themselves an animal advocate, that your main motivation, or one of your main motivations, is wanting to do good. You don't want animals to suffer, you, know, you want to protect them. But we also have, probably all have, personal motivations as well. For example, we might want to express our beliefs of ourselves. It's a common human tendency to want to let the world know what we think and what we feel about issues that are important to us. We may also want to have fun, you know, like hang out with our friends, do activism with them, work on issues and campaigns and tactics 
that we find at least somewhat personally enjoyable. And probably all of us have the motivation of wanting to feel good, of wanting to feel like we're living a meaningful life, that our life has more meaning because we're working to make the world a better place. Now, all of these personal motivations are a natural, happy, a natural, healthy part of being a whole, happy human being. But we have to realize that sometimes these personal motivations can conflict with that other, more altruistic motivation of wanting to do what works, or what works best for helping animals. So let me give you a couple of examples of this. So uh, I was mentioning earlier this hypothetical situation of tomorrow, I go into an English class here at the university and I talk about factory farming and vegan meat and so forth. I'm going to show you a picture of, two pictures of me. One is from today, I think you'll recognize me, and the other is from 10 years ago. Which one of these two meetings do you think would be more effective at going in and talking to these students about why you should become vegetarian or vegan? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not super clear, but there's a lot of weird and even more good luck. <laughs> so, you know, the unfortunate reality, it, it, it might be good, it probably would be great if we lived in a world where people did not judge one another based on appearance, but we all know in our society. They do. And we all know that these two men could be equally intelligent, say exactly the same thing, be you know, perfectly well informed, say the same thing word for word. But we all know that you know, the one that looks more normal is going to be more effective and inspiring for people to change their beliefs and to change their attitudes. That's all for this bias. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Sorry. <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, again, it would be great if we lived in a world where that wasn't the case, but the reality is we live in a world where it does. And simply changing from one appearance to another can mean the difference between saving the lives or sparing the misery, or not saving the lives and sparing the misery of thousands and thousands and thousands of animals. And for you know, it took me a while to change, and for any of you here who think you could might perhaps maybe you should have a more mainstream appearance, but you don't really want to, which I never wanted to, it took me years to change. Here's the thing that got me to change. You know, I thought, you know, if my mom was going to be killed, she was going to have a throat slit or all these things that happen to farm animals. And I knew that just by looking a certain way, I'd be 20%, 30% more likely to save her life. Of course I would. We all would do it. So if I would do that for one person, of course I should do it for the thousands and thousands of animals that we can save by, you know, having as mainstream appearance as possible when we're interacting with the public. When we do it on our own time, you know, feel free. All right, moving on are interactions with the public. So, let's say that tomorrow I was doing some vegan advocacy here on the campus, passing out booklets or something like that, and a student comes up and they want to talk to me. Again, they're not necessarily on board, they're not vegetarian, they're not vegan, but they're willing to have a conversation about these issues. What is going on in the back of my mind as I have this conversation? Am I thinking, I need to tell this person that, you know, if you care about animals, you have to go vegan, and you'll live five years longer, and it's the best thing, it's the most important thing to do if you care about climate change, there's millions of male chicks being grabbed up alive and cheered by the industry. You can spread 31 animals a year by going vegan, and you know, on and on and on and on and on. Or, in the back of my mind, in my thinking, who is this person standing in front of me? And what can I say, and how can I say it, that's going to be most likely to get them to do what I want them to do, which is change their beliefs and their behavior in a way that saves the lives or spares the misery of all animals. Those are two fundamentally different approaches. The first one is focused on expressing what I want, what I believe, and what I know. And the second starts with the end goal in mind, and it works backward from that. And as you can all imagine, it's that second approach that will be much more effective at actually changing attitudes, at actually changing behaviors, and saving lives. Now, one thing that this means is that we should always employ, whenever we're doing advocacy work for animals, trying to persuade people to change their behavior, we should always employ those social skills that we use in other areas of our life. So the same social skills, the same warmth and friendliness and charm and professionalism that we use to try to get a job that we really want, or try to get a date that we really want, or the ways we act when around, when we're around our very good friends. We should be using all of those same social skills in all of our interactions with the public where we're trying to get them to care about animals, or just you know, care about this issue, and change their diet, or change their life in a way that helps animals. The more we do that, the more they feel like we respect them, we like them, or uh, you know, we listen to them, so on and so forth, the more likely they will be to change. Lastly, choice of activity. You know, 
there's so many ways that animals are mistreated, and consequently, there's so many things we could do to advocate on their behalf. So how do we choose how to spend that limited amount of time, and money, and energy that we all have? Do we do fun and funny things, such as this PETA protest from the US, where a limo full of midgets dressed in chicken costumes <laughs> ran out in front of McDonald's, chanting about, I am not a nugget, and stop the cruelty? Do we do things that our friends are working on? Do we work on issues that are in the media right now? Do we work on issues and campaigns that we feel we are best suited for, that we have the most talent for? Do we work on issues that have personal relevance to us? For example, if I have a dog at home that I grew up with that I really love, maybe I work on you know, preventing uh, animals from being euthanized because there's not enough homes. What is motivating our choice of activities? Is it any of these things? Or have we honestly kind of taken a step back and thought, you know, what campaign and what approach is going to save the greatest number of lives, spare the greatest amount of animal suffering? We all start with the desire to do good, to be on the right side, to stand up for animals. We all start there. But it's important for us to, over time, move forward, and as quickly as possible, move forward to not just doing good, but doing the most good, the most good we can for animals. You know, if we think about the for-profit companies of the world, Adidas, Coca-Cola, so on and so forth, they all have a bottom line. Their bottom line, of course, is dollars and cents, and so every decision they make is made with an eye towards that bottom line. If it makes more money, they do it. If it makes less money, they don't do it. How to advertise, who to market to, what to sell, so on and so forth. We as animal advocates, we have a bottom line as well. Now, of course, our bottom line is not dollars and cents, but I would submit to you that our bottom line is two things. Saving the lives and sparing the suffering of as many animals as possible. You know, if we, if we honestly believe that animals they're farm animals, companion animals, wild animals, whatever type of animal. If we honestly believe that every animal is an individual whose life matters, whose pain matters, whose pleasures, pleasure matters, uh, who's an equal to every other animal, if we truly believe this, then I feel that we're ethically obligated to do the work that will spare the greatest number of those individuals. Spare the greatest number of those individuals from a lifetime. Now, one important thing that this means is that uh, the issue that we choose to focus on can make a huge difference in how many animals we'll be able to help. So this next chart is also from the US, but again, the principle is going to be very similar here in Switzerland. So this is an extremely rough figure, but very, very rough. If you add up all the campaign victories and successes and so forth achieved by the animal protection movement in the US, in the areas of animal testing, for many animals, wild animals, animals in entertainment. If you add up all the success they've had, they're sparing about one million of these types of animals each year from a life of misery or being killed. One million. That's great. A million lives saved. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. But if we look to those who are just advocating for diet change, not even those working for farm animal welfare, which is a way to help a huge number of animals as well, but even if we just look to diet change and those advocating diet change, whether for animal reasons, or for health reasons, or other reasons. Here is the number of animals being spared a life of misery each year as a result of that work in the United States. 500 million. There are 500 million fewer animals being raised and killed on farms in the U.S. this year than there were six or seven years ago, as a result of, of course, in part, not fall, but in part, diet change advocacy. Now, it's not because people working on diet change are smarter, or more hard working or anything like that, the people working on these other issues. It's simply a function of the fact that because there's so many farm animals raised and killed, and because every person who eats animal products is contributing to the suffering that's killed, that just happens to be, right now, and certainly for the foreseeable future, farm animal issues, whether it's diet change or farm animal welfare, happens to be the area where we can do the most good, spare the greatest number of individuals. Most likely. Certainly more than any of these other areas. So the more we spend the majority of our time encouraging diet change or advocating for farm animals, we can become much, much more effective, spare many more animals over the course of our life. In closing, you know, it's really bizarre that we live in a world where every one of us in this room absolutely and very easily has the power to spare thousands, if not tens of thousands, of individuals like her 
from a lifetime of brutality and misery. It's bizarre that we should have that power over so many other lives. And yet it is a fact. I mean, if you just volunteer with one of the groups here or on your own, doing smart vegetarian vegan advocacy, do it two hours a week, each week for the next couple of years or for many years in the future, without a doubt, you will spare tens and tens and tens of thousands of animals, of individuals from this life of misery. I would uh, suggest to you or assert to you that is there, ask about this, is there any better use of our time and our money and our energy than working to end brutality and the cruelty that we all know is going on on these farms? If we think about what we're going to do tomorrow night, or this weekend, how we're going to spend our time, if we think about how we're going to spend our money over the next month, or our creative energy, our thoughts, is there any better use of any of those things than doing the work that we know will save individuals like her from a lifetime? The more that we use a research-based approach, the more our advocacy work is guided by facts, by, well, by research anyway, about what works and what doesn't. And the more we adopt that bottom line mentality of what will save the greatest number of individuals, spare the greatest number of individuals from a life of suffering, the more we adopt that mentality, we can become, we will become exponentially effective, spare countless more individuals like ours. That's pretty much it for me. Uh, for anyone that is interested in reading more about this general social psychology research and how it applies to activism, uh, or that's interested in checking out the new book that looks at all the research on vegetarians and vegans specifically, what that means for vegan advocacy, I was not able to bring books with me because I'm in doing like a five-week tour, and so I'm not able to, you know, love books, books in every city. So what I did is I brought with me, with me these little cards that have websites for each book. You can go on there, you can read several chapters for free. Bye. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Thanks so much for you know, to the organization for having me out here today. And I guess if we have time for questions, I'm happy to answer. So thank you so much.
change if it's in line with how they see themselves. So, you know, what I try to say in those situations is basically like, oh, you know, it's awesome that you care about how animals are treated. It's awesome that you don't want to, you know, you want them to be happy and not suffer. And then, but unfortunately, the reality, the reality is farms is very different than the forms portray. And you know, I mentioned a couple of cruelties. And um, so hopefully, pitch it as I know this is the sort of issue you care about. You're a compassionate person, so you'll probably be very interested to hear that this is the suffering that actually goes on. So frame it as so frame it going vegetarian as right in line with who they already are and what they already believe. Should hopefully. Um, so, I mean, I guess it depends the exact context, but my simple answer would be two things. So one is, again, health is a really important motivator for people. So that may be something that motivates someone who doesn't care about all that animals. And in fact, getting someone to go vegetarian, for whatever reason, is a great way to get them to care about animals. If we look at studies of people who went vegetarian for health reasons, or they just thought it was disgusting or whatever, a sizable percentage of them, the, the majority, later add animal ethics as one of the reasons for staying vegetarian. And a sizable percentage, percentage, smaller but still sizable, now have that as their main reason for staying vegetarian, even though they initially went for reasons. So getting people to simply make a change not only helps animals, but is good for getting people to adopt these beliefs as well. But I would also say, just as a general point, that um, yeah, like there are millions of people here in Switzerland. And you know, if there's one person who's really obstinate, and you don't think he's going to change, like your friends or family members or whatever, probably it's a better use of time to just go out, do smart vegan advocacy that's reaching hundreds or thousands of people, rather than focus a lot of time on one person who just does not want to change. Because you know we know some percentage of the public, especially students, will change once they learn the reasons too and the benefits. So the more people we reach, you know, we know we'll get some percentage of change. So like with my friends and family, I mean most of my friends happen to be vegan just because of the work I do, but like with my family. When I started, when I went to the and vegan, I talked about it with them for the first week. It did nothing. And then I gave up. And then years later, they you know, went mostly vegetarian, mostly vegan. Um, but if I like, banged my head against the wall with them for like weeks and weeks, you know, I would have been much better to spend that time doing vegan advocacy focused on people who are open to it. Anyone else? What about influencing uh, decision makers? Yeah. Other than just the general public. Wouldn't that be more effective? Yeah, a very good point, and absolutely yes. I mean, if you could get one member of the general public or one influential person to care and make a change, definitely. And I do, I do talk about that in the book. Um, and for example, one of the one of the programs that I work with, um, with the, the farm animal protection group I work for, is we have figured out the universities in the U.S. where the most, politi you know, top politicians, richest people, heads of companies go to school. You know, what colleges they went to. So now we're putting extra emphasis on those schools to influence the future influentials at a time where they are more open to it as college students. So yeah, you know, if we can get you know, church leaders, business leaders, politicians, media figures, getting one or two of them or three of them to care and to talk about the issue with the people they're connected with can really help spread the message, not only because they reach large numbers of people, but because they are often trusted by the public as a you know, more mainstream, more, um, more someone whose opinion matters. So yeah, that is absolutely um, very important stuff. More cool. What, what is your biggest wish today? I uh, mean, what um, happened to you? Besides From the stop? Yeah, besides yeah. the whole world we're meeting at once. Sure. What do you hope for um, more risk? From all of you? <laughs> or for, for, for you? Um, so, like, just because, like, what do I have a reasonable expectation like, my day would be accomplished in the world? What would you like the risk to be accomplished? Okay. The next few years. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, like ideally, you know, a world where there's no, there's no, there's no suffering, animals aren't suffering, sentient creatures aren't suffering. But for the next couple of years, you know, the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, I think the growth the number of people who are vegetarian or vegan and eating less meat is one of the most important things because, as we saw with that 500 figure, that 500 million figure, you know, we can do so much good just by bumping the percentage of people eating these diets up. Five to ten to fifteen percent. So I think that's one of the most important things. Um, also, starting to pass as many laws as we can to protect farm animals, because those sort of laws can, can impact huge 
numbers of animals if we get the task. Um, so I think those two things are really important. Um, lastly, I don't know to what extent each of us as individuals can do this necessarily, but um, the more we can advance the creation and the popularity of products, you know, vegan products that are similar to meat, uh, but it make it easier to be vegetarian or vegan. The more we can create those and get them out there to the public, basically the more easy we can make it to be vegetarian or vegan. Kind of, by kind of you know, shift by adding the products or by shifting you know corporate policies and things like that. Um, those are probably the ways that we can do the most good. So you know in my hopeful vision for 15 years from now, a notably higher percentage of vegan, vegetarian, you know, less meat, the number of farm animals being raised in is going down. There's numerous new laws passed that reduce the cruelty to farm animals. Well, companies are adopting you know, less cruel practices and so forth. Uh, you said that for individuals, the foot in the door policy works well to uh, to bind them for future behavioral change. Yeah. But uh, as a society, what would you say to the argument that a country with a very high class uh, uh, law regarding farm animals might uh, not see that as a problem uh, as much as a problem as in other countries. Yeah. Like, do, do you think that the foot in the door policy works as well with like banning uh, caged uh, chickens and stuff like that? Or would you say that there is a reasonable argument that that might uh, make the problem go away without really resolving anything? Yeah. So it's not easy to do, and to my knowledge, there is not really scientific research on this. So this is just my speculation from experience and from this research and so forth. But my belief is that, yes, the same, uh, the same process works in society. So if we think about uh, new ideas that have become mainstream, how they affect, so you know, uh, marriage equality, you know, civil rights, um, women's rights, things like that, all of them did advance step by step. So people like in the United States, like Martin Luther King, civil rights leaders and other people leading these political movements, they pretty much always advance, you know, step, you know, step by pragmatic step. So first they get one thing, then they get the next slightly better thing, and the next slightly better thing. And they, they articulate their vision, especially to the base. But in terms of pragmatically what they do day to day, campaign to campaign, is taking the next step, the next step, the next step. And we see with those movements and many other things that indeed uh, societies that start moving in one direction are more likely to continue moving that direction. And I've had this experience with some of the uh, university or corporate campaigns that I've done as an advocate. So companies that have been persuaded to change one of the policies to be more animal friendly do tend to be more open to additional changes that help animals. So I think yes, that, that it works in society and with businesses as well as with individuals. Talking about the book in the doors, what about the opposite?
Yeah, so just so I'm clear, like, is there, are there examples of this research being applied and working? Is that the, the, the general question? Okay, cool. So uh, the organization I work with, the Humane League, there's very little research on this subject in general. There's basically no research on, like, specific to say vegan or vegetarian advocacy, this works better than that. There's this general social psychology research, which we can apply and soon it will often work. But there's almost nothing specific to vegan advocacy. So the group I work with actually started kind of research wing um, to do the sort of direct testing to find out. So a year from now we'll have you know, much more data. Uh, but the one thing I would say is this. Um, the nonprofit I work for, uh, last year one of the things we did was create a 16-page booklet and also a 10-minute video talking about you know, why to go vegetarian and so on and so forth. And we try to incorporate uh, as many of these research-based principles into the design of those things as possible. Did that, you know, produced these things, and then we tested them against other materials that were considered kind of like best in class, like the best similar materials that the movement was already using, to see what worked better, you know, what other people had considered the best, or our new thing, which we tried to use these principles. And we found that for both of those, for both the leaflet and the video, it was significantly more effective at inspiring people to change their diet. So, you know, we didn't look at like one tool in specific, like put in the door in specific or anything like that. But it did seem that at least these two test cases, that using this kind of suite of social psychology research and these tools did make the vegan advocacy effort significantly more effective. 35, 65, 80 percent more effective based on all of that. Um, speaking of these two strategies, door in the face and foot in the door, um, what are the characteristics of different situations that we could perceive and then conclude? That the one or the other strategy works better. Yeah, you know that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I don't either. There's not studies on it. Or I just haven't seen them. I don't know the answer. There's plenty of studies on both. And um, you know, one other option is combining the two for the foot in the face. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you know, ask people to make a big change and or just call it a change later. Maybe that will work as well. So yeah, unfortunately, I don't know if it's I wonder, uh, this, uh, these two numbers, the 500 million animals, is, yeah. are those industry numbers? Or, uh, uh, they're, they're government numbers. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what I wonder is, uh, how do you measure uh, how much people that you uh, reach with your uh, leaflets uh, reduce meat? If they say, I only reduce meat, because I get the impression that everyone is uh, very little me when I talk to them, and, yeah. and less than last time, and so on. Yeah. So how do you get around this? Yeah, to accurately measure yeah. how much people that we are. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, in, during the research for the Veganomics book, it very sad to look at studies from the early '80s to today. In almost every study, like somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of the public say they're eating less meat than they did before. For so apparently, meat consumption has been going declining, declining, declining. Even though in reality, you know, it's been for the most part going up and up and up uh, until recent years in the U.S. Anyway. So yes, a lot of people who say they're eating less meat are not eating less meat. You know, we've only done um, one or two studies on the impact of certain programs, and we have not done the best job of controlling that exactly. We kind of try to use kind of like backhanded ways to control for the fact that a lot of people are who say they're eating less meat are not doing it. Um, but we haven't done it as rigor rigorously as we should have. So I would say that like the one or two studies we've done would not be good at test examples of how to really thoroughly control them. So I have a suggestion, namely, uh, tell people uh, go vegan for X days or per month, per year, per a week. Yeah. And uh, it seems easy. I think many people can picture themselves doing or go vegan for X meals per, per week. And then you can ask them how many big meals have you taken. And I think it's, I mean, it's just an idea. It's the way I do it. It's uh, only, I only ever use vegan. Uh, but I'm not uh, dramatic about it. They have to go totally vegan yeah. from one day to the next. I think it's, <laughs> it's also, uh, it's, it's uh, all these principles that you uh, talk about in the book uh, are uh, in this approach too. 
because I think it's it's more concrete. People come with them think about is this vegan, and not is this a bit less meat, and they don't put it on a scale. So it's like, yeah, it's a free brand for us. Yeah, I mean, it, it could it could be a good approach. It could be a better approach. Um, one thing I would say in defense of the value of people eating less meat. This doesn't mean this should be our strategy, but in terms of the value of the public eating less meat. In the US, that 500 million <coughs> number of animals being raised, uh, statistically, there's nowhere to eat. It's, it's not even near possible that the increase in vegetarians and vegans is accounting for even the majority. Yeah, but so I, majority I totally pets. agree with, I mean, someone who, who eats two more vegan meals per week, and oh, yeah, say it's, it's, yeah. it's a meat reducer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, and that, that could be a better approach. I mean, I guess. We need to do a study to see yeah. whether that's better or just encouraging for these people. <laughs> but I do think, I do agree with your point that encouraging people to make some specific change yeah. is good in this kind of nebulous, you know, nebulous sense. It's a very good point. Is there also research showing that uh, advocacy has detrimental effects mm -hmm. people? Like sometimes I hear from people that have a bad uh, image about animal advocacy because yeah. they all just yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't really know of any studies of that. The only thing I can think of is you know, there are studies that track public support for things like animal testing that have tracked it over time in countries where there was a rise of this sort of like you know very militant action. So there are a lot of vandalism, threats, like all that sort of thing. And that would certainly you know the one or two cases where this was the case. Of um, it does. You do see a increase in public support for animal testing when these things are going on. Like you know, whether those things are causal or just car related. Um, but but aside from you know one or two things like that, I don't know of any research that has examined that. But I would agree with you that absolutely, I'm sure there's a number of, of advocacy approaches and things people are doing that have a net negative effect. But I'm just no studies on. Yeah, so we were uh, wondering on uh, nudge approaches. So one example for a nudge would be um, the thing that the University of Kassel did. They, um, like a half year ago, um, they renamed the uh, menu options. Before it was called the vegetarian menu and the meat menu, yeah. or something like that. They renamed them. And also they increased the number of vegetarian options. And just by doing that, and probably also because of the whole campaign that was Going on. Um, yeah, the number of vegetarian dishes consumed uh, increased by one third. Um, meat consumption went down. So, are there other examples of um, nudges that can be made? Yeah, absolutely. And that's definitely an error where if we have the power to affect such change, we can do a lot of good. Um, a colleague of mine, Tobias Leonard, who runs the Belgian Vegetarian Society, he has a great talk that I recommend looking up. And in it, he has a photo of, uh, and this is a concept that some of you may have heard before, but it's a rider on an elephant. And he says there's three things you can do to get the elephant to go in a certain direction. You, you can influence a man sitting on top of the elephant, which is represented here kind of people's rational, logical side. You can influence the elephant, which is representing people's kind of emotional side. Or you can, sh you can create a path through the woods. So the elephant just follows that path without even thinking. And so changes like this that make vegan eating easier, just like more present, can get people to do it without ever consciously choosing or deciding, you know what, I'm going to eat more vegan meals. If you walk into the cafeteria and the first thing you see is all these delicious vegan meals, then you're going to be more likely to buy them than if they're all stuck in some corner in the back of the cafeteria. So yeah, um, you know, I guess one or two other examples that come to mind. In the U.S., there's a number of school districts, which uh, elementary school districts, which have gone meatless on Monday, so they serve only vegetarian meals on Monday, such as Los Angeles, which has a huge number of students. So simply because of that policy change, there are 680,000 students who every Monday are eating a vegetarian lunch. Not one of them had to decide, I care about animals, I'm going to eat vegetarian today. And yet, you know, because eating with more compassion has just been made the default, it is much easier for people to do it and for sure. So yeah, I think to whatever extent we can, we or our groups can make these sort of uh, system changes that make it easier to do the right thing, to make the right thing the default option, um, we can be, we can accomplish a lot of good. And um, the book you kind of referenced, uh, there's a great book called Nudge, 
um, which looks at this, which I definitely highly recommend. And I do talk about some of it in the book as well. So, yeah, thank you for bringing it up. That is a very good question, and I, I do not know. I don't know if any districts have looked at that, but I tell our really want that. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would guess they have, but yeah, they don't. Absolutely, yeah. Good question, because yes, I, I absolutely think they're wrong. I mean, for example, if you're 
you know, when, when our organization is campaigning against an institution, for example, we've done a lot of campaigning to get universities to stop buying eggs from the from battery cage egg farms. And we start off very nice, and whenever we talk to them, we're very nice. But you know, if we do lots of steps and no change, we do lots of campaign, and so we have a website with you know very quick video, language condemning the University of Diamond Services for supporting and so on and so forth. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I say that more in terms of like one-on-one -on -one interaction um, with where you, yeah, one-on-one -on -one interaction. So if I was going to a meeting with someone I was trying to persuade, like the head of Diamond Services, I still would be very nice, very friendly. Like I might, you know, I would be blunt and say like, you know, this is what we're going to do if you don't change, so forth, I'll be honest. But I would stay very friendly and I think that's very important. But I do think certainly in campaigning, uh, there not only is there room for negative attacks, but those things are often more likely to succeed in that kind of campaign setting. Uh, what about the presentations? Like two groups of people? Sorry. Like presentations <laughs> the audiences? Uh, so what would be an example of being negative in one of those? Like, like what would, how would you be negative in that? Like yell at your audience? Like you're here? <laughs> <laughs> right. But you can't show people every amount of things happening. Oh. I don't think it's negative to show being angry about like, cruelty or anything like that. Um, perhaps that could be a good thing and an inspiring thing. I, just that you wouldn't want to be angry at your audience. Any last questions before we wrap up? So, the last one. Um, I worry sometimes that I give advice from, from very direct and short term that I might be a little short sighted. So, I don't know, maybe one example might be um, yeah, you, um, you outline how individual stories were more effective generally. Um, stats. Yeah. Um, but you know, it may be the case that to the people that are likely to be most effective as activists, mm -hmm. stats might be more impressive. So, I mean, uh, a case would probably be made, and uh, I think I do have some anecdotal evidence, it's okay, just anecdotal evidence, I still think it's quite significant, that um, if, if you can appeal you know, with stats to people who may be into stats and into a more you know, quantitative approach, yeah. that might be very effective, then that might be I mean, one could also argue that maybe the movement in general is at the very early stage, where it's maybe more important to get new activists than just you know, new like, some people who change uh, their diet. So these may be arguments. And, and another point I, I got me thinking was um, yeah, the correlation with um, it being a female thing. Well, that's also the stereotype, and of course it's grounded in the numbers also, as, as you've shown. Uh, now, if we're specifically targeting women, that might that not backfire, because you know, it may increase the stereotype with being a female thing, and yeah. then you know, men might um, be even more strongly under the impression that their balls will shrink and will And that might be a bad thing on men. So, you know, all these uncertainties, yeah. what would you say? Yeah, good question. So, for the first one, the first point, I totally agree with you. And I think it just speaks to the fact that we, the main thing is what message will appeal to your audience. I certainly think for activists in general, like the general public, stories are much more motivated. I mean, looking at the membership of organizations uh, like in the US, Farm Sanctuary or the Humane Society, which in all the communications focus on individual key animals, they're the organizations which have tons of members, tons of support, and so forth. So I think for general activists, the same applies for the general public. But absolutely, I think there's groups of activists who think more about the members. I am one of them, and I would be much more persuaded by hearing that something helps 10 animals than seeing a few picture of the animal. I think. Um, so yeah, I think uh, if we know our audience and we know that that's going to be more influential to them, then definitely we should use that. So it's just about knowing our audience. Um, and then for the second point, it's a very good question, women versus men. You know, one other reason, uh, one other argument that it could be good to target men is men eat more animals. Uh, if we look at the average American meat years, men eat about 20% more animals than women because they eat more meat. Um, on the other hand, here, you know, and I, I don't know which approach is best, but here's why I think it's still better to be women. So, number one, you're likely to convert a higher percentage of people. So, targeting 100 men, 100 women, you probably create, in theory, but also uh, in some of the kind of test we run, twice as many vegetarians by targeting women. So, you, you get that, that good initial burst. Secondly, if you look to the growth of vegetarianism and veganism, uh, that ratio of men to women has been about the same. So, as more women have been going vegetarian, more men have been going vegetarian as well, even including the fact that in the past year or two, some of the main vegan advocacy groups, at least in the US, have been really focusing almost entirely on the 
Um, so I imagine that trend will continue, that simply having more women will also bring more men, because women will persuade friends, family members, and friends. Um, last and two important points. So while, of course, things are changing, uh, in the U.S. and other countries, it's still the case that women control the majority of food decisions. They control what's bought, they control, control what's cooked. So having vegans and vegetarians control that means their husbands, family, and so forth, you know, whatever, will be eating more of the Chinese food. And lastly, um, women tend to be much more communicative, both on social media and in general. So women share things more often on Facebook. Um, they share things more often in person, according to the studies I've seen. So a, um, I don't know whether one gender is a better activist than the other much. But in terms of people in general, vegetarians in general, it seems like women are going to be more likely to share this idea with their friends, both their male friends. So those are the reasons that I still follow myself.